miracles. The God who answers by fire. Now, we've been preaching on the elements. Uh, we're, we're just, let me just say it this way. What we're trying to tell you, if you haven't figured it out four weeks in, I'll put it on a bumper sticker. Bumper stickers are not my specialty. I'm more about scrolls, but I'm going to put it on a bumper sticker. We're trying to tell you that the Bible is themed around several ways of describing how God recreates order out of chaos, how God takes back what the enemy has tried to steal, how God uh, counteracts entropy with grace and life. And so one of the ways the Bible talks about that is with the ancient terminology uh, of earth, water, wind, and fire. And actually beyond that, ether. That's the world that's to come. That's the unseen realm. That's, but you have to go through the process of transmutation. That's Everybody talked about alchemy in the ancient times, and we think they're so silly for that because we know better than that. We've got chemists now. Uh, I thought, as, as Sister Chandra was telling her story, I thought we've come so far that we don't even know anymore that the power of death and life is bound up in our tongue. That doctor thought he was so smart telling you he doesn't believe in, I, and I don't mean this ugly because this is just what everybody has been taught. He doesn't believe in the healing. He believes in the cancer. I thought if, if I was a betting man, and I'm not usually, but if it's really a sure thing, if I was a betting man, I would not bet on the cancer in this scenario. Because as far as I can see, cancer gave its best shot. And what I wish I could tell that doctor, just roll up on him real quick with his bedside manner and tell his bad self, you know her husband wouldn't even say the word, right? You know he wouldn't even give it enough acknowledgement. He, he treated cancer like we treat school shooters. He wouldn't talk about it. He would say what it was doing. He would say where it was at, but he wouldn't say what it was because it wasn't for him to decide whether there was cancer in her cells or whether there was health in her cells, he was bringing that to the great physician. I, I, I just, I want to see somebody begin to believe in the cure more than we believe in the disease. And, and so I, I want you to understand that those ancient alchemists, they wouldn't have talked like that. They may not have had as much understanding but they had more knowledge and definitely more wisdom about how things actually work because what they were trying to tell us is that there is a process a supernatural process by which that which is lower and base in nature may be transmuted and glorified into that which is higher and so in scripture God always begins with dirt or mud or dust or smoke and ash and he always ends with gold and honey and amber and and with fire and then once you've passed through the fire, you qualify to be in the ether. You qualify to be in the unseen realm. So I'm not going to try to take up an inordinate amount of your time today, but we had a lot on the docket, and they said, I really hope there's enough time for you to, pa uh, to preach, Pastor. And I said, I have laid out for four weeks. There's plenty of time for me to preach. So if you'll preach with me, we may get through it in really good order, okay? I need you to preach with me because somebody needs the word that's going to come forth right now. And it is more than one of you. I know I'm one, but it is more than one of you. Somebody needs this word. Somebody has a divine appointment today. You may not know it yet, but God has chosen this day to roll up his sleeves and reach down in your life. Grab a ball of the mud that you're wallowing in. Separate it out from the waters of your distress. Blow upon it with the wind of new life. And let the fire of his spirit begin to transmute that vessel into something he can use.
So our preachers have done such a remarkable job. Earth, wind, water, fire. And I, if you haven't heard every single one of them, you need to go back and listen. I mean that. It's, it's crucial. We need this message right now. But my job today is number four, the God who answers by fire. In 1 Kings 18 and 24, Elijah is staring down one man alone against 400 prophets of Baal who all work for his arch enemy Ahab and, and his wife who's the, the, the Carl Rove, for those of you that get that reference, the power behind the power and Jezebel. And he's staring them down in the face and, and, and boy, they are very confident that they can prove that their God Baal is the God of Israel. And you know what? They were kind of right because their God Baal did represent the official state religion. But what they didn't know is that uh, Elijah was familiar with the elements. If you read Elijah's life, you'll see from beginning to end, there's a theme about fire. There's a theme about fire. And so um, uh, I, I think that they were not totally expecting what he said because the Bible says in 1 Kings 18 and 24 that he looked them dead in their shifty little eyes, all 400 of them. And he said, I tell you what let's do. It's it's not exactly fair. It's just it's just 400 of you, and there's one hole of me. And so kind of like David with Goliath, I don't think you know what you're up against, but let's, let's give you a fair shot. He said, I'm going to give you a running head start just to make it fair. As Rush Limbaugh used to say, half my brain tied behind my back. And so uh, in that moment, uh, they, the prophets felt very secure until they heard what Elijah said. He said, I tell you what let's do. We'll each get a bull, and I don't care. You pick first because I don't want you to think that I've got cards up my sleeve. We'll kill that bull, and we'll lay it on an altar to our God. And whoever's God answers by fire. This is 1 Kings 18 and 24. The God who answers by fire fire. He is God. And all the people said, that's a good idea. I like that. You know why? Because they were pretty sure that this was going to work out where both of them were going to look like idiots until somebody figured out how to pull a quick one. And they had 400 of them. And I guarantee you they figured they could pull off a quick one quicker than Elijah could. So they they begin to, they get their bull and they, they build their altar and they lay the bull out on the altar and they begin to pray and chant and it, it reaches a frenetic pace and they begin to pace and 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 all it, it finally reaches a fever pitch uh, and and Elijah says oh you know maybe he was on lunch might have a new secretary doesn't know the phone system very well just keep calling at this point Elijah is just enjoying the spectacle. I, I, I would like to encourage somebody today to say that if you believe in any corner of your soul that you serve a God who answers by fire, then you need to learn the art of letting the line out when you're playing with the enemy. You need to learn the fisherman's art of not always yanking up on everything, trying to get it done right now. A lot of people have ripped a lot of hooks out of the lips of a lot of good fish because they wouldn't let the line out just a little bit. Sometimes you got to let the enemy play around a hard and oh, I'm pretty preaching and nobody knows it but me but I'm telling you some of us need to learn the art of telling the enemy that's all right you just work at it a little while longer can you imagine how that that's like that is the ultimate uno reverse card he's so used to you blubbering and squalling carrying on and just oh my and me and boo-hooing and and what if you just woke up tomorrow and chose violence stared the enemy right in his little pixie face and said do it some more devil Devil, do it some more. Keep playing with that line. I think you'll get through pretty quick. And they began to cut themselves and, and just, oh, they made a whole mess. And eventually, when it was about dark, Elijah said, all right, you good? 
Can I humiliate myself now? And so the Bible says he drew near and he repaired the altar of the Lord, which was broken down. We can't get into that today, but there was already an altar on that mountainside. It is good news for us today that regardless of the fact that we do have some enemies in our lives that want to steal the good work that God has planned among us, promised land, hear me. We are not building on unconsecrated ground. We are not building uh, from, from zero. There are still holy stones lying around from an altar that has already existed in this place. I wish somebody would give the Lord some praise right there. And so, and so, e e Elijah repairs the altar and, and he, he slaughters the bull and he lays it out on the wood and all that. And they think, all right, now, here we get to watch him just 399 down. You get to watch him try to talk his God into answering by fire. What they did not know is that Elijah's God not only answers by fire, he is fire. In other words, the answer to any conundrum presented to God is God. I am that I am. I'm the self-existent one. What else do you want to know? Pretty sure I'll be whatever I'm going to be when you need whatever you're going to need. And so Elijah, knowing this, says, hey, lend me a hand, will you? Uh, get, get three barrels of water and go ahead and dump them over this, this, this sacrifice, this wood. Soak the wood real good. And at first, they might have thought he was just doing like you do the wood chips, you know? Soak them so it gives up good smoke. And... But then he said, hey, do it again. Do it again. Twelve times. Oh, there's something there. And when that 12th barrel was emptied out, the Bible says not only was the wood fully soaked and the bull fully soaked and the stone and the dirt fully soaked, but then water had begun to run down off of the altar and down into the, the uh, ditches all around the altar where the blood had been. And, and now there's just rivers of water. There's earth. There's water. There's, there's blood. And, and guts everywhere but we've got the elements of creation beginning to assemble and then Elijah stands back and he says now Lord God show them what's up and here come that wind carrying that fire. And not only did it sit on the altar, it consumed the sacrifice. And not only did it consume the sacrifice, it consumed the wood. And not only did it consume the wood, it consumed the stone. And not only did it consume the stone, it says it licked up the dust after it was done consuming the water because I have a God who answered by fire what do you have Jezebel God bless you you may be seated now I am going to go a little bit over but if I keep preaching this good is that okay in Luke chapter 12 Jesus said I have come to cast fire upon the earth and how I wish it were already kindled then he said something more haunting than that. But I have a baptism to undergo. Actually, in the Greek, it says, I have a baptism to be baptized in. I have a baptism to undergo. Remember, I said that's waves coming over you. That's overwhelm. That's being under the wave when it breaks. I have a baptism to undergo and how distressed I am until it is accomplished. Have you ever had that sick feeling in the pit of your stomach when you know that the papers are gonna be served any day? Or you know that the, the bailiff, the sheriff is coming 
with the extra lock anytime, or you know that the test is in the laboratory and the results are due back anytime. That feeling in the pit of your stomach when, when your mama says, go in your room and wait for your dad to be home from work. Is that just me? <laughs> Worst feeling in the world. I have come to cast fire on the earth, but I have a sense of anxiousness in my guts because I know what's coming. When he was talking about this baptism, baptism was a common uh, uh, piece of the parlance of the ancient Near East when they were talking about trouble. You would say, it's just been a baptism lately. Just one thing after the other. I can't catch a break. Am I preaching to anybody? Jesus says, I got so much trouble coming. I've got so much trouble coming. And then I've got this nervous feeling. Isn't it good to know that Jesus fought butterflies in his stomach when he was staring down the barrel of the mess that we got ourselves into? Jesus had to deal with the nerves of it and, and battle the anxiety of it as, as he wrestled his flesh, the bull of his flesh, into submission on the altar. The Greek phrase uh, that, that you'll, you'll see if you use the interlinear Bible, which not only has the Greek words by the English, but it orders them the way the Greek orders them. Jesus, in, in that uh, language, doesn't say, I have come to cast fire on the earth. He says, fire have I come to cast upon the earth. Much more punch, get up and go in that. Can you imagine standing next to Jesus and, and, and the disciples had just said, hey, by the way, you've been, you, your stories have been getting kind of dark lately. If I had a dime. And, and Peter said, are these, are these more for us or more for them? Can you imagine? That's Peter. Now, Lord... These stories you're telling, I, I don't know much, but I know enough to know I don't like them. Are they about us or are they about them? And, and this is what you get back. Fire have I come to cast upon the earth. Probably not what Peter was looking for. I don't know quite what it means, but I'm nervous now. Baptism. I've got nerves. I'm submerged. I'm overwhelmed. We say in our church, are you dry, dripping, or drowning? That's courtesy of Jonathan Brewster. That's a way we check in with each other. People say to me in this altar, they walk up to me sometimes and they just say, I'm drowning. We don't have to say anything else. We just start praying. You don't have to tell me why, because I've drowned too. I know what that is, but I have a God who answers by fire. And I still believe in him. Trouble, calamity. Fire represents a line of demarcation. Pastor Jonathan opened us up with a very good explanation of a controlled burn where you see the fire coming so fast that there's no time to get enough water in the way of it. It'll lick it up just like it did on Elijah's altar. And so if you can't get enough water to drop on the fire because it's coming too fast because of what? The wind. Then what you got to do is resort to a scorched earth policy. And you have to go and, and, and you have to put some accelerant down in a long straight line. And you have to burn a swath of ground all all around that fire so that it will be contained because the one thing fire has a lot of trouble jumping is somewhere that's already been burned and so sometimes fire is a mercy sometimes fire is safety it doesn't feel safe but it'll save your life when the wind is blowing trouble at you. It's a line of demarcation. What was before the fire never can be again because it has been swallowed up. I have a baptism to be baptized with. Behave. John 2, 17 says, His disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house will consume me. 
zeal for he, by the way the thing that reminded them of that was Jesus braided a whip and started clearing out the church zeal for your house will consume me that word zeal zealos it's uh, heat heat fervor it comes from the root zeal to boil with heat as of water or anger to boil with heat get a little hot under the collar Feel that red mist descend, that's zeal, the God who answers by fire. So I want to give a PSA. I have to make it interesting now because we're going into overtime and I got to keep you on the hook. So I'm going to make a PSA that I've been wanting to make for a little while. Um, Brendan, you know, my, my son, my mini-me, um, he has not taken up smoking. No matter what you hear. But I feel the need to say that because uh, um, he, he currently has a, a Bic lighter that he's carrying everywhere with him. I don't know why his mother blames me for this like she does everything else. The other day he came into the kitchen, sat down breathed a big sigh, emptied out his pockets, dropped his big lighter on the table, and she looked at me and said, that's your fault. <laughs> and he may have developed carpal tunnel, uh, or at least sprained a thumb in the last couple of weeks because <laughs> every, every dude in here that's ever been nine knows what that's all about. Men make fire. He's in his pyro era. So it got me thinking, what is that universal preoccupation that humans seem to have with fire? I got a torch the other day so we could sear some meat. And it said you could sear meat with it. And, and I put it on the, long, and the longest flame I could get. And I just started laughing. I thought, I... I'm not even sure that I could, could light a fireplace with that. You can't sear some meat. Me and Brendan were looking at it. We're laughing. And then for some reason, my thumb slipped. The flame was already going. My thumb slipped, and I hit that trigger again. And, that, and Brendan goes, oh, we have a flamethrower. <laughs> Next thing I know, he's clawing and pawing at me. Give me that. Give me that. Give me that. You can say the ability to command and control fire is maybe one of the primary evidences of the unique role of Adam's race in the order of creation. Maybe that's why we're so preoccupied with it. Some species of ape, the odd bird, has adapted the ability to both make and use primitive tools. You got, you got little uh, critters that are pulling ants out of, out of holes in trees with a with a stick that they've developed and uh, science is on the cusp of revealing that whales probably use complex language patterns that relate to ours almost exactly to communicate language, actual language uh, with grammatical rules and uh, other species can mimic our own speech minimally so it's really not speech necessarily like we thought it was at one time that sets us apart but no other species apart maybe right from the primordial dragons we'll have to put that in a little box over here i think that's probably got to do with another story of a different time and another dominion but maybe they had fire that they could breathe but no other species apart from that has even begun to develop even the primitive adaptations you would need to develop the ability to command, to control, to harness the power of fire. The ability to control fire, I put it to you today, is a primary indicator of the divin dominion of humankind on earth. And fire produces light. Light is the first step on the journey out of the darkness of chaos there's no recipe more sure to produce chaotic destruction, though, than to have fire without boundaries. 
That's the paradox of the power. Dominion is about order. The recipe for producing order out of the elements of chaos is simple. First, you have to turn on the lights so the roaches can scatter. Somebody needs to hear this today. Stop running from the light. Every time you come to he for help to the altar, you hear the click as the light goes on and you run. Don't run next time. Let the light of God shine on the darkness and the chaos in your soul and watch what happens. Because light is the first step on the journey out of the darkness of chaos and dominion is about order and you have to shine a light of revealing on that darkness and disorder. And so in order to shine a light of dark on that darkness, you have to have fire. You light a fire. Immediately, as soon as you've done it, you're confronted with the need for water. You gotta have water in the interest of exercising dominion over the fire because fire will rule you unless you rule it first. So you have to identify your water source immediately and harness it. Finally, you're gonna need dry ground to lay your kindling on and build your fire. And with that, you can begin any craft necessary to subdue chaos and advance order. So consider the one, two, three of the creation story at the beginning of your Bible, Genesis 1. The earth was formless and void. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. The Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. Here's the elements. Then God said, and in the Hebrew it just says light, and there was light. And there was e and God separated the light from the darkness to make the light useful he had to divide it out. And there was evening and there was morning, day one. Then God made the expanse and separated the waters be uh, below the expanse from the waters above the expanse. How surprised were you as a baby when you learned that when you look up at the sky, what you're looking at is big pools of water that gather above your head and cling to each other until they drop down and become the waters below. And it was so so God called the expanse heaven, and there was a second day. So fire, water, dividing of them both. You got to, as soon as you've got it, you've got to divide it from the opposite. Then God said, let the waters below the heavens be gathered into one place and let the dry land appear, and it was so. But God called the dry land earth and the gathering of the waters he called seas. So earth, fire, water, Divide it all out, make it orderly, and the wind is moving on the face of the water. We're cooking with gas now. And it was evening and there was morning. A third day. You ever wonder what Jesus was doing down in the belly of the earth for three days? And now you know. He went to the fire to talk to it about the water and separate out the darkness from the light and bring forth the dry land of redemption from the muddy bog of sin and death. Man, I'm preaching. Can I go a few minutes if I give you this? This is freedom. This is where freedom lives. The value of the light exists in its separation from darkness. And the value of water exists in its separation above from below and dry land from sea. And the value of land exists in its separation from the sea. So how do we know this is the message of Scripture's account of creation? Elementary, my dear Watson. Dominion is about order. Order is about separation. Separation is about purity. Purification is a primary property of both fire and water. Wind is the primary means of conveyance for both fire and water. Wind, fire, water, cover the earth with the knowledge of the glory of God. And earth is that fr from which all things come, which must be ordered, shaped, purified, to call order out of chaos and produce purpose out of potential. God is a God of order. And his primary attribute is that of his separation from all else. 
that is, was, or will be. He is altogether unlike us. Thrice holy, the angels cry, holy, holy, holy. Separate, separate, separate. Distinct, distinct, distinct. Unlike any other, unlike any other, unlike any other. Matchless, matchless, matchless. Perfect, perfect, perfect. All by yourself, all by yourself, all by yourself. In a category of your own, in a category of your own, in a category of your own thrice holy and our very confidence of hope in him rests upon our recognition that he is unlike all else first john one john says what was from the beginning concerning the word of life was manifested light and we have seen and testify and proclaim to you the eternal life. That's what I'm doing today. I'm proclaiming to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. This is the message we have heard from him and announced to you that God is light and, say it with me, and... And in him is there no darkness at all. That's the value of the light, the absence of the darkness. That's what makes it God. That's what makes it good. If we say that we have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. Brother Eric, I forgot to get back with you about that this week. Please remind me. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light we have fellowship one with another and the blood of jesus oh and the blood of jesus his son cleanses us from all sin i feel the wind blowing the premise of fire today is this that the living god is a consuming fire and when he comes he brings the heat. I want to go up and, and reread what uh, I, I read to you uh, if I had time, but I'm not going to do it. But if you go back and find each of these scriptures in the archives and go through and read the context of them. I had to leave out all of the gold. I had to leave, leave out most of the references to the elements. If you'll take it upon yourself to do the Berean thing, to be like the students of the word in the Bible and say that preacher yelled a little more than I'm used to and he seemed a little over excitable and he clearly had not taken his meds but I think he might have dropped some knowledge on us go and look at the scriptures that I am referencing and read them in context and ask the Holy Ghost to give you understanding as you read because he will reveal himself to you because the living God is a consuming fire, and when he comes, he brings the heat. Listen to how David, King David, described the scene on the day that the God of heaven and earth heard his cry for help and descended out of heaven to deliver him out of the hands of all of his enemies and even more amazingly, out of the hand of a jealous father-in-law. Psalm chapter 18 says, Death encompassed me. The torrents, the baptism of ungodliness terrified me. The grave surrounded me. Death confronted me. Is there somebody today that can, has that testimony? As, as our dear sister Chandra was telling her story, that's all I could think. That's all I could think is the, the terrors of death confronted me. The grave overwhelmed me. In my distress, I cried to my God for help. He heard my voice out of his temple. Then the earth shook and quaked, and the foundations of the mountains were trembling and were shaken because he was angry. Smoke went up out of his nostrils, and fire from his mouth 
devoured. It ate, it ate, it ate, it ate. He bowed the heavens also and came down with thick darkness under his feet. Somebody ought to get real excited right there because you may be in thick darkness, but it's under his feet already and he hasn't even got to you yet. He rode upon a cherub and flew and he sped upon the wings of the wind. Are you seeing? I'm not just saying it. The elements, the elements, the elements. It's over and over and over. He made darkness his hiding place. The Bible says Moses approached and drew near the thick darkness where God was. Somebody in this room needs to leave here today and never again be afraid of the dark in your life. It is not the will of God for you to be bound by the fear of darkness. I'm telling you, don't shrink back from the dark and the cold. Uh, step up and quit yourself like a man. Quit yourself like a woman and just say, I know the dark is deep and the night is cold, but I also know no, God lives here. God lives here in the middle of this dark. From the brightness before him. Oh, so darkness, thick waters. Dark waters are his canopy, his hiding place. If you could, his hunting blind. But from the brightness before him, past thick clouds, hailstones and coals of fire. Just so you know, this is how the ancients spoke about lightning. Hailstones and coals of fire hurled across the heavens. The Lord also thundered. Oh, you didn't believe me? In the heavens. And the Most High uttered his voice. Hailstones and coals of fire. Somebody said, I prayed. I asked God for help. And then the storm started. I said, help me. I'm drowning over here. The grave has come up at me. Death has confronted me. I could have sworn he heard me. I felt his anger at the enemy. But then night fell. And the dark came. And the storms hid. And the thunder rolled. And the lightning struck. Yes, stop screaming into the wind and trust the peace speaker. He moves in the storm. He sent out his arrows and scattered them, and lightning flashes in abundance and routed them. Then the channels of water appeared. Then the channels of water appeared. That's an image of God producing a big storm with wind and hail and fire so that he can get some water on the ground and then he goes <laughs> and blows a riverbed for it to run in. Then the channels of water appeared and the foundations of the world were laid bare at your rebuke, O oh Lord, at the blast of the breath of your nostrils. He said, God melted the world down and started over from scratch on my behalf. He remade my world because I cried out to him. He sent from on high. He took me. He drew me out of many waters. He delivered me from my strong enemy and from those who hated me for they were too mighty for me. They confronted me in the day of my calamity, but the Lord, but the Lord, but the Lord was my stay. For you light my lamp. The Lord my God illumines my darkness. I'm just following the elements. The Lord my God illumines my darkness. I pursued my enemies and overtook them, and I did not turn back until they were consumed he received a baptism of fire so that he could receive the indwelling of fire so that he could move like fire you said god consume my enemies and he said sure i'll put it in your mouth i shattered them so that they were not able to rise they fell under my feet then I beat them fine as the dust before the wind. I emptied them out as the mire of the streets. We can begin to move toward the music. The Lord lives. Blessed be my rock and exalted be the God of my salvation. If you made it this far in just a few moments, he's going to meet us here in this altar. And no matter what's going on in your life, no matter how dark 
the night, no matter how heavy the storm, no matter how terrifying the thunder, no matter how bright the lightning flashes, no matter how devastating trouble has been, he's going to meet us in this altar with consuming fire, burn up the filth, and reveal the ore, the pure gold. The properties of fire are this. The fourth element of fire is a product of combustion that requires fuel, heat, and an oxidizing agent, oxygen. Fire is a producer of energy, warmth, climate control, incubation, denaturation so that something can be softened into something more moldable and then hardened into something more usable preservation heat for cooking food for melting materials smelting ore igniting baking setting we fire a vessel in the kill before we try to put anything in it fire is a preventer of peril fight fire with fire did you know that the forest service in the northwestern united states went around shutting down, fining, and imprisoning the indigenous peoples of this country because they had a habit of burning their forests in semi-regular ways. And along we came on our white horse, all knighted up and ready to save the day. And we started punishing them for enacting the wisdom of their forefathers back who knows how many millennia. And in the last couple of years, as we watched in horror in the west, southwest and northwest of our beautiful land was just ravaged and eaten alive by fire, that the elders of the tribes just shook their heads with tears in their eyes and said, we tried to tell them you can make a law against fire, but you can't make fire stop if you don't have the fire. Our fathers taught us that a controlled burn will stop the chaos. So we had to come hat in hand, apologies and curtsy our way out, tell them you, you, as you were as you were. It's a purger and a purifier. That's why we have trial by fire. It's also incidentally why we have baptism by fire. In the spirit-filled movement in the Pentecostal church, we get very excited about the Holy Ghost and fire because if you're like me, you thought fire was a feeling. You thought fire was a passionate display. No. Fire is a purifier. I'm trying to help you today reposition in your life your understanding of the hell God has unleashed in your world or stood by and watched as it burned. The primary property of passion, fire. Better to marry than to burn, Paul said. And then passion itself is a fire, either in the pursuit of lust or in submission to purpose like Jesus on the cross. Fire is a polarizing phenomenon because it embodies the power of both creation and destruction and love it or hate it, it will touch your life and you will have to deal with the fallout. Fire is the path to perception. I am the way, the truth, and the light. Your word, O Lord, is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. The path of the righteous is like the first gleam of dawn, shining ever brighter to the full light of day. All those who live godly shall suffer persecution, baptism by fire. Fire is a powerful paradox. It represents transformation, transmutation, energy, but also destruction, devouring, and reduction. 
Because fire is a potentiator of purpose. We say, you better light a fire under it. Fire the engines. Fire your weapons. Hold your fire. They had more firepower. In his last three days on earth, one of the messages Brother Phillips gave us, he sat straight up out of a cold sleep, seized my elbow, and said, the coals, the coals, the coals, the coals! I said, Bishop, I get it. My mom used to sing, it only takes a spark to get a fire going. And soon all those around can warm up in its glowing. That's how it is with God's love. Once you've experienced it, you spread his love to everyone. You want to pass it on the coals. Fire is the process of purging and perfection. I'm preaching to someone as we come into the altar who is in the fire. And I want to tell you about a prophet who received his call in the fire. Pastors, come because we're coming into the altar now. I want to tell you that the promise of fire in the Bible is this, that the fire of God will soon incinerate the elements of a fallen cre creation in the crucible of crisis. The skies will be rolled back like a scroll as earth is melted down like a hot ball of wax and like a phoenix from the ashes of chaos, a new heaven and a new earth will appear. The enemies of good and of God will be obliterated in the ash heap of his crematorium, but the meek shall inherit the earth. The name of the Lord will be for us a strong tower. The righteous will run into it. And the umpire will cry, safe! And all those who love his appearing shall be saved. Peter said, know this first of all, that in the last days mockers will come with their mocking, following after their own fires, after their own lusts. And saying, where is this promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. Don't fall prey to the normalcy bias. For when they maintain this, it escapes their notice that by the word of God, the heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed out of water and by water through which the world at that time was destroyed, being flooded with water. Come on. These people want to get in the altar so we can get home. Thank you, pastors. But by his word, but by his word, the present heavens and earth, they've been baptized in the water. They're being reserved for the fire. Why? Because if you baptize something in water after it dries up, it can be subject to oxidization and decay again. But if you, and, and so it may be clean when it comes out of the water, but time and mess and life. But if you really want to get something elevated all the way up to its, its golden state where it can step through the veil and into eternal purpose, you can't just take it through the water, you got to take it through the fire. And so this time when God redeems his creation, and this time when he restarts the clock, and this time when he kicks the devil's tail, and this time when he does his work, this time it's for good. There will be no more going back. There will be no more slow fade into decay and sin and destruction the Lord uh, has reserved the heavens and earth for fire kept for the day of judgment Croesus, Croesus, division that's that word the Lord is not slow he's not slow about his promise but patient he's not slow he's patient don't get it twisted he doesn't want anyone to perish. He's trying to give us space to repent, and we would do well to take that today. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief in which the heavens will pass away with a roar and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat. 
and the earth and its works will be burned up. Since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning, and the elements will melt with intense heat, but according to his promise, we are looking for a new heaven and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, since you look for these things, be diligent to be found in, by him in peace, refined, spotless, and blameless, and regard the patience of the Lord as salvation. Don't, 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 don't think about whether you're patient enough to sit through the sermon because the preacher started late today and is ending kind of late. Thank God. That the end is nigh, but it is not yet. And we still have today, which is the appointed day of salvation. See that you don't resist him that speaks from on high. Do not, do not sleep on the promise of his coming. Do not mistake his patience for apathy. Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. Look at your neighbor and say, Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus is coming. And he's coming in hot. Everything that can be shaken will be shaken. I'm talking about the promise of the fire. And every work that is not of him will be burnt. The only remnant of creature or creation that remains will be that which has already been tried in the fire. No fire is pleasant when it burns, at least not if you're in the flames. But there is a fire that purifies and there is a fire that incinerates. And the difference is not in the coals, but in the crucible. The same fire fire that consumes the impurities that fall into the flame produces purity in the ore within the crucible get in the pot and let him cook let him do his thing give him some time take the heat don't run from the kitchen we're going to need endurance to let him cook jesus has purposed to prepare a bride for himself without spot or blemish Oh, I thank you, Holy Ghost. You know, the God of this world's preparing another fire too, but there'll always be three Hebrew children that don't care what culture has to say about it. I want to be in the 7,000 that haven't bowed their knee to Baal. Uh, I feel the Holy Ghost. I feel the Holy Ghost. Pray for Sister Brenda Green. That's the dear wife of one of our overseers, Pastor Randy Green. Two of the most godly and Christian people I've ever met in my life. And she got her cancer diagnosis. Guess what? Guess what? Guess what? My father can kick cancers behind. It is time for a generation of Esthers and Daniels to arise who fear not what the enemy has prepared because they know that God will be with us. When you walk through the flood, I will be with you. When you pass through the flood, I will be with you. And when you walk through the fire, I will go with you. Nine days ago on May 10th, Shantae Wright Haywood, who has five beautiful babies in the school system, who's working on a, in the medical profession with a specialized degree and is also a student at nursing school, was selected to fill a vacant seat in the single member district board of Del Valley District 6, board, the, the District 6 of the Del Valley ISD School Board. Stan Shantae, this is a position of extraordinary power and influence. The enemy's already in a whole mood about it. Sister Felicia, would you grab some oil and go over there, lay your hand on her head and just tell the enemy that we're going to give him hell because we got plenty to go around. Let the fire stop fighting fire in your life. Let the fire fight the fire. Stop 
railing. Yeah, we can stand. Stop railing at the heat in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. You're appointed, now you're anointed. Go, Esther, go, Esther. Fulfill your calling, Shante. May the Lord God be with you. I need a couple of elders to pray over a cloth with some oil on it. While they're praying for Sister Shante, agree with me right now. And we're going to send this cloth to Sister Brenda Green. And we're going to say, no, we serve a God who answers by fire. Say what you want, Del Valley. Our God answers by fire. Say what you want, cancer. Our God answers by fire. Who can endure the day of his coming and who can stand when he appears? Now listen to me. Listen to me. There was a man in the Bible named Isaiah and God was going to call him as a prophet. And he said, I was in the temple and I saw the Lord high and lifted up. The train of his robe filled the whole temple and there were these angelic beings above him. And they, they were keeping him separate. They were making sure nothing came into his presence that didn't belong there. And he said, I, I couldn't believe I was looking at him and I wasn't burned up. And he said, I said, oh God, I've seen God. And an angel came to the altar and took a coal off the altar and brought it and touched his lips and said, you've been touched with a coal from the fire and now you are forgiven. Your sins are forgiven. If you need the fire to do its purifying work in your life, come join me in this altar. If you have not been baptized with the Holy Ghost and seen the evidence of the speaking in other tongues, Come join me in this altar. Over the coming weeks, if God will give us the grace, we're going to explore understanding the recipe for the incense that God said burn it on this altar. But I want to thank Brother Tim Cruz for doing the work and the, the great uh, uh, scholarship and effort of compounding for us God's chosen incense. I want to thank him and Brother uh, Gus and Brother uh, um, Alvin and Colony for this incredible altar. We're going to learn about it and the fire that goes on it. But I just want to encourage you that as you pray, God is mixing your life into a blend that smells just like Jesus to him. I'm telling you, when you're going to get intimate with somebody, you check yourself to see how you smell. And God is saying to some of us, you are so upset with me for the fire and the bitterness in your life, but I wish that you would let me do what I want to do because I'm trying to produce a certain smell in you so that your prayers won't be hindered anymore. I need somebody that's been waiting a long time for the answer to a prayer. Come join me in this altar. Come join me in this altar. I need somebody that needs a refreshing of the Holy Ghost. Come join me down here. I know somebody's got five minutes before you go home. I'm talking about I need the Holy One, the God of heaven and earth, to touch my lips with a coal of fire and cleanse me and make me new. At the very end of our Bible, we read that an angel came before the altar of the Lord and filled a golden censer with incense mixed with the prayers of the saints and let that smell waft under our Lord's nose. I wonder today if you could accept that he is producing incense in your life. Come down here and thank him for the fire. Come down here and thank him for the work of purity that he's doing and let 
him cook. Somebody lift your hands right now that needs to receive or be refilled with the Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost filled people pray in the Spirit. Receive the Spirit in the name of Jesus. Thank you so much for being with us on Pentecost Sunday. We really do have a God who answers by fire.